we started getting involved with stealing cars. Not only did we steal the cars, but we also got in contact with chop shops, people that were running chop shops all in Brooklyn. So we, we, we go inside the club, we're hanging out, and I fucking couldn't believe it. You had women walking around naked. You had uh, women walking around with chains on their necks and guys from pulling them like they were master and slave or whatever the fuck. Right. But when I would go there, I would act like I was king shit. You know, I'd go in there, tell them to give me a drink. I'd fuck around with their women. I'd snort cocaine. I'd put my foot up on the women. I was like, fuck you. You right. know, I, I, that's the way I got. And the bigger I got, the more of an asshole I became. But I was taking care of business. And he put the gun to my head and uh, I, gave, I gave them the money that I picked up. And then I said to myself, they're going to kill me. So I got I to gotta try something. I got to do something. So I turned around real quick, jumped on that guy. And I started hitting him. Then all of a sudden, I felt a real stick like this real quick. Boom. And they pronounced me dead at the scene because they didn't feel a pulse. They didn't feel no pulse on anything. So they put me in a fucking body bag. Hey, this is Matt Cox. And I'm going to be doing an interview with Tommy Harding. Tommy is a former mob enforcer and a former bounty hunter, and he's got an amazing story. Well, check this out. My story is a little non-conventional. No, a lot non-conventional. Um, I was born uh, in Brooklyn, New York, in a neighborhood called Borough Park, Brooklyn. That's actually where Barbara Streisand was born. It's a Hasidic Jewish neighborhood on 53rd Street at 15th Avenue, Brooklyn, New York. You don't look Jewish. I know, right? And I sound Italian. Figure that out. Um, what were your parents, you know, uh, married? Were they in the household? Brothers, sisters? Yeah, let me explain this a little bit. My dad is African American. He's from Georgia. <clears throat> My mom is uh, mixed with Polish, Italian, black. She's she's just a total mutt. But if you right. look at us, she could pass for white. Uh, my uh, we had a total of eight. Uh, siblings. I'm the six of eight. But here's the thing. When they got together, each of them had two kids. So they had four, okay? And then they had four more. My brother Benny, myself, my little brother Viotis, and my little sister Darlene, which made a total of eight. At the hall. Yes, it was... Uh, I wore a lot of hand-me-downs. And we had one fucking bathroom. Mm -hmm. We were... We were living, this is the deal. My dad was the superintendent. The owner of the building was a Jewish guy, Mr. Landoff. He, my father was a, a mechanic, electrician, a plumber, you name it. He could do it, okay? So they gave him an apartment in the building, right? But it was a right. basement apartment. We lived in the basement. We were right. people that lived in the basement at 53rd Street, and my father was the one that did all the... The, the buildings of uh, maintenance and fixing or whatever, but he used all his sons to help him do all of that work. You follow what I'm saying? The only downside that uh, my dad had was uh, he was also an alcoholic. Right. Dead one. Very violent. My father was very violent. And uh, the person that felt that the most was uh, my mother, my mother Margaret. As a child, what I watched. I mean, my dad would uh, get drunk, come home, raise hell like you would not believe. He was the type of guy that broke things all the time. You know, he'd bust up things, cussing at her, drinking. And we're the little kids that you see standing around. Now, I was watching him do this when I was like five. You know what I'm saying? So it was, uh, it was something else, I got to tell you. And watching my mother cry constantly. She couldn't get away, you know, where she's going to go with all these kids and she had no job. She was, back in the day, we're talking about the 70s, and, you know, back in the day, my mother, she didn't have a really good education and stuff like that, so she was kind of trapped. Right. Yeah, my, you know, same, it was a very similar situation growing up with me. Only, only four kids and we weren't in the basement, but yeah, it was, she, you know, they're, they're trapped. It's like, you, you know, people say, oh, well, why do you stay? What, what are you going to do? You got no kids. How am I going to support four kids? No money. Yeah, exactly. 
So, you know, it's not like, um, yeah, it's, it's not like, you know, there was a huge child support like that back then. If he said, I'm not paying, you're not getting it. Exactly. Back in the day. Exactly. You know, my mother was terrified of driving. She never drove, you know, she tried, uh, but she was just a nervous wreck and she couldn't drive. She never drove a vehicle, never owned a car. So, you know, uh, it was very difficult for her. But uh, as I got older, uh, things got worse. You know what I'm saying, Matt? Um, when I became a teenager, about, I don't know, 13, 13, 14 years old, uh, I started hitting the streets a lot in Brooklyn. But see, in, 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 in Barrow Park, you could not do nothing around that neighborhood, hang out with the, with the Hasidics because they kept themselves. So what I did was, me and my brother, what we did was we went to Bensonhurst, which was only maybe, I don't know, maybe a mile from the home. The neighborhood changes in different directions, okay? You could head uh, south from the front of my home and you're in the Spanish section. You know what I'm saying? If you head north, you go into where the Italians and the Irish are. You, you follow what I mean? So different yeah. areas, that's where we, that's where I hung out at. And that's where I started to uh, get connected with the raw people. No right. plan. Who, yeah. So who were the wrong people? I mean, well, you were, how I how I first got started, uh, I joined a gang back in nineteen. Oh my gosh, so much. Nineteen seventy five, nineteen seventy six. A uh, gang in my neighborhood. You know, we thought we were king shit. You know, we wore these uh, uh, jean cut off sleeves. You had the warlords on the back of it. You know, we thought we were tough shit. You know, how old were you? Uh, yeah, they were mostly, uh, it was mixed too. It was like, we had Italians, we had Hispanics, and uh, and uh, and I was the only black guy that was with the crew. How how old were you? I mean, I was about 15. Okay. About 15 years old. You know, it was kind of crazy when they when they came up with this movie called The Warriors. I was just thinking that when you said that. Back in 1979. We were the original warriors because we were the warlords and we were the guys that were jumping over turnstiles, running, running, running down the platform, jumping onto the trains and the cops chasing us. You know, we did all of that kind of stuff. But uh, we started uh, uh, getting involved with stealing cars in the neighborhood. Right. And uh, what we did was not only did we steal the cars, but we also got in contact with chop shops, people that were running chop shops all in Brooklyn. I'm just talking about deep in the Italian neighborhoods. Okay. We would bring the cars there and they would pay us. Of course we wouldn't, they were, we were good at stealing cars, but you gotta understand something back in the seventies, they didn't have all these key fobs. The hoods were locked. Most people left their cars locked. There was no alarms. It was easy stealing cars back in the day. You know what I'm saying? And uh, all you had to do was have a slap hammer, slap out the ignition, slap out the ignition and then take a screwdriver and start the car. You know, that was, that was the deal. You know, and if the door was locked, you remember the, uh, the when you pull up the unlock the door, it had that big button on it. Oh, you had yeah. to stick a hanger in here, pull it up. Yeah. You're in. You're in. So we were, we were, we were doing good. We were, I, I can't tell you how many uh, cars that I, we, we stole. But then as we got, as I got older, we started getting into uh, uh, shoplifting. We would do a shoplifting and stuff like that. We would go to the city. I was just thinking that remember the old cars, like a lot of the windows, they didn't even have a metal piece that they slipped it. You could actually just pull the window out. And flip. Exactly. Like exactly. That now it's like, how do you even get into the, cause it sucks up into the, the metal or the, you know, whatever that, the metal piece that goes around. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I was just also thinking <laughs> I make TikTok. So I was thinking, you know, in shorts and stuff, I was thinking I'm going to use the warriors. I'll use the warrior. I'll do a clip with this and have the warriors running because you know there was all those uh, fight. You know they had they'd have the fight. They would pull out the switchblade. Yeah, they'd all kind of stand off. They'd have the gang. It <laughs> was a great movie. Oh, I love them. I love that movie. But that's basically uh, how it was for me as a teenager. And the thing about th that is, I started outgrowing all my friends. I mean, I was I was getting bigger and then i started uh I, I saw this movie right i never knew anything about this guy this guy named arnold schwarzenegger right and i saw this movie uh the coming to tries to call pumping iron or something pumping iron on tv and i was looking i was like damn that's that's kind of cool and i was still involved with the warlords at that time right 
So I went and I saw that movie. And when I came out of seeing that movie, I saw it at the Oriental Theater in Brooklyn, New York, where a buddy of mine named Neil and Ray, I fell in love with bodybuilding at that point. I had to get weight somehow. But at that time, I had no place to put them. You know what I mean? So so uh, I, I, I started working out at my friend's house, Orlando. This guy's name Orlando Rodriguez. And he had weights at his house. And I got the money together. And we bought our weights. And I started training. I became so obsessed with working out at that point that that I just got gigantic. Then I got into nutrition. And then that just made me more dangerous. Uh, you know, I, by the way, just another side note, I actually made my girlfriend watch Pumping Iron the other day with me, probably with, probably, not the other day, it was probably two, three weeks ago, because she'd never seen it. We're like, you've got to see this movie. Got to. That's that's a must, a must see movie. Yeah. With everybody. Oh, and that was, was fantastic. I, I watch it occasionally, you know, just to bring me back to my 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 best decades that I can remember uh clothing and women and everything were the, the late seventies, mid to late seventies. You know what I'm saying? The girls had the uh tube tops and bell bottoms and all that kind of stuff. I uh, that was that was my time. You follow what I'm saying? That was that was that was my decade, the seventies. But uh, uh, I got a little bit a, a little bit more crazy. I started meeting uh, a lot of influential people, and I was making a lot more money uh, with the cars. And then they bumped me up a little bit. Now you gotta understand something, right? I'm this African American guy. I'm hanging out with the Italians and the Irish in Bay Ridge, going to their bars, hanging out. Not anybody like that. <laughs> right. Not all of the guys like that. I had guys come over to me, and I'm going to use this word. I'm just going to go out and say it. What the fuck is this nigga doing in here? You know? But when they would say that, the guys that I were with, we would confront them. We'd have like a standoff in a bar, and then it would calm down. And no one would get hurt, but that happened quite often. For a while, it would stop like cold. Right. But uh, uh, after a while, everybody got to know me, and I was earning money. They started using me as a as a as a bag man, Shylock. Me, at eighteen years old, Shylock, and in Brooklyn, New York. But are you you're doing it for someone, correct? Yeah, I was doing it for someone there. In Brooklyn, right. New York. Now you gotta understand something. You you're probably uh, well aware of this. They had a lot of social clubs in uh, in Brooklyn, right? Okay, and I could name I'll name one social club that that I met a, a lot of people, connected people from. It's called the End Result. It was on the Utrecht Avenue and Fifty Sixth Street, called the End Result. Okay, and uh, I would go there. These guys they would be playing cards and doing their thing and hanging out, smoking cigars, whatever. And uh, they would give us jobs to do. What we had to do, pick up money. I started picking up money, uh, loan sharking and stuff like that. And uh, everything changed when I went to uh, Manhattan. I went to Manhattan. I was hanging out in Manhattan uh, with my with my friends. And we just happened to be at this bar. And uh, kind of, uh, 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 we had a great time just drinking, hanging out with young guys, whatever. And then uh, this this uh, go outside, and you know, back in the day, they hand out flyers, right? People right. hand out flyers. Hey, man, go to this place. We got girls. We got this. We got that. Whatever. This changed my life when this flyer got handed to me. Somebody handed me a flyer that said Hellfire on it. Why? That said Hellfire. It was a club, an S and M club, on 14th Street and 9th Avenue in the Meat District. I've never been to an S and M club. I didn't know anything about S and M clubs, and I was with a, a buddy of mine again, Neil again. And I said, "Hey, you want to go? Let's let's go check it out." Did you have any idea what it was? No, I I didn't even know what S and M was. Come on, you got to remember, right, Matt? There was no there was no fucking internet at that time. There's no there was you know what the you know what porn that I got? You know my my dad's stash. <laughs> right. That was my porn, and and back in the day, he had these eight millimeter films. That we used to put in the projector and it's without sound. That was my pull. Okay. <laughs> Unfortunately. So uh we go to the club and it's actually subterranean. 
it goes down into the into the street. It goes down. You get a there's a doorway. There's a triangle building on 14th Street and 9th Avenue, right? And it's a couple of hundred years old. This fucking building. And once you go inside, there's a long staircase that goes down. You can hear the music thumping the ground. You can hear it thumping the ground. Like holy shit, this this seems pretty cool. What was outside, man, was limousines and shit. I mean, like rich people. Ain't no broke motherfuckers going down there, right? And once we made it down the stairs and made it to the right, I, I see this man in the the, the, the window. He, I'll, I'll never forget it. He had a DA, DA haircut. He had gold frame glasses, a mustache. He was smoking a cigarette. And he says, do you have ID? And I go, yeah, I got ID. And he showed him my ID. And he says, oh, Thomas. Yeah, everybody calls me Tommy. And I said, what's your name? He says, my name is Jimmy. That man changed my life. Okay. So we, we, we go inside the club, we're hanging out and I fucking couldn't believe it. You had women, um, walking around, uh, naked. Uh, you had, uh, women walking around with chains on their necks and guys from pulling them like they were master and slave or whatever the fuck. Right. They had, uh, sh- they had a stage up there and they had some girl and, uh, she was, Butt ass naked, but you had some guy licking her toe, licking her feet and sucking on her toes and shit. Then you turn around to the right, and there's like a pool, like a not pool, but it's kind of like almost like a large tub. There's a guy in there, and there's a girl peeing on him. That's what I found out about golden showers. They were doing that right there as well. You had open drug use on the bar. People were making lines of cocaine, snorting cocaine, doing their thing. And I got to tell you something, uh, uh, they have porn stars down there. And I know they were porn stars because me and my boys, we used to go to Times Square and we used to watch uh, uh, Vanessa Del Rio, uh, Veronica Hart, Tiffany Clark, Joanna Storm. They were all down there hanging out. Women that I masturbated to a time they fucking hanging out <laughs> right. in the club. And I couldn't believe it. And uh, uh, Jimmy came back out of the, uh, uh, the, the, the cashier's booth couple hours later was talking to me and he says you're you're a pretty big guy he says uh uh you looking for a job he says i can use somebody to do some security down here with the with the other guys and i said you fucking kidding me i fucking i, I won't get for free <laughs> right you know what i'm saying and uh, uh uh to make a long story short i came back to work at the club and my my everything changed Everything changed. I did security for him for a while, and he loved the way I handle handle people. Now, I never, never hurt anybody that don't fucking have a coming tool. That was my rule. If I'm telling you not to do something down in the club and you do it, you're going to get so manhandled to get out that fucking club, you're not going to believe it. Okay? But if you're drunk and you're just drunk and you don't really know what you're doing, I'll carry you like a fucking baby to a cat and pay for it. Right, it's all account. It's it's all the way you act to get a reaction from me. Okay, Jimmy loved that shit. He loved the way that I was. And then come to find out that Jimmy was connected. You know, he was a connected guy. And uh, he he basically took a real liking to me, and I was starting to look at him as like a as a father figure because I was telling all the shit that was going on in my house with my mom and my dad and all this kind of shit, whatever. And at this time, you got to understand something, Matt. At this time, I'm older, I'm bigger, and my father, he still drinks, but he's, he, he, he doesn't, I don't allow him to hurt my mom. You know what I'm saying? Because when, when, I, when I got 16, 15, 16 years old, I was out there doing my thievery, I, 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 I confronted my father and I, and, I, and I threatened him. And I said, don't you ever put your fucking hands on my mother again. I'll kill you. You know, and he never, he never did. I never hit my dad. I'm going to get that out there. I never hit my father, but I did say it to him. Don't you ever touch my mother again. And that was the time when I was changing. I was doing criminal activity. I was this badass motherfucker. And then he, he became kind of, uh, how can I say, uh, he got sick. You know, he got sick and he wanted to, to, uh, to, to leave New York and, um, and take my little brother, my sister with him to Florida. And basically, that's what happened. Um, he took my little sister, my little brother, to fuck with my mother. I gave her money to leave here. I set her up. I set her up with a place on Avenue C in Brooklyn, New York. I gave her, I gave her a place. 
Now, my mom knew, my mom wasn't no fool. My mom was really, really a Catholic woman. You know, she goes to church and she prays a lot and she, she, she writes a lot of books and stuff about her kids and whatever. Because, listen, I wasn't the only kid that had problems. My brother, St. Clair, in and out of jail. My sister, Renee, heroin addict. Okay, Benny, pill addict. You know what I'm saying? So the only ones that were clean were my little brother, Viotis, and my little sister, Dolly, and they're the ones that went with my dad to Jacksonville, Florida. And me, I started working full-time for Jimmy. Okay, real quick, why do you think he took your little um, your little brother and sister with him? Was there a specific reason? You want to hear something crazy? This is the crazy shit. My mom finally, you know, I... We, she, we got her, I got her out the house. They were still living in the basement, my dad, right? And my dad was in and out of being sick because he started to have liver problems, okay? Yeah, I mean, yeah. drinking. And uh, 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 he wanted, my father wanted to get back together with my mother. And my mother wasn't having it. Yeah. So he felt, he felt heartbroken about the way that he was. And he would not, you understand something? When he, when my dad wasn't drinking, you know, he, he was a good guy. He was a good guy, you know. Uh, um, we we never been touched, <laughs> you know. We never no nothing like that. He he was just violent physically with me and my brothers when we were little, but he never touched my my sister. He didn't believe in hitting my, my uh, little girls, giving them spankings or anything like that. But he did it with the boys. Did it with us. He loved them, and he wanted he wanted me. Believe it or not, he wanted me to go with him to Jacksonville, Florida, as well. And I told him, "No, I'm not going. I'm going to stay here to take care of my mother." And he wound up taking my brother, and my sister, and actually he took my uh, my sister Renee's two kids, Janelle and Dawn, because my sister uh, she was a, she was an addict, and she couldn't take care of her two kids. So uh, he wound up taking those four and moving to Jacksonville, Florida. I got my mother a place on Avenue C in Brooklyn. And I was working in Manhattan uh, full time with Jimmy, full time. Okay. Uh huh. But it, but it, but things got things got bad after a while. At at the club, or at home. Well, well, let me let me explain it to you. It goes a little something like this. Um, I started uh, partying a lot. Okay, this was the eighties. I started stoning cocaine at the clubs. And uh, we were getting protection money. I was doing certain clubs in Brooklyn that I had to go to and force protection money on them. In other words, if you want to have your club open next week, you have to pay us this amount of money every week. And I went to the Spanish clubs threatening them. And they were paying us for a while. You know what I'm saying? They were paying us. But when I would go there, I would act like I was king shit. You know, I'd go in there, tell them to give me a drink. I fuck around with the women. I snort cocaine. I put my foot up on it. I was like, "Fuck you," you know. Right. I, I, that's the way I got. And the bigger I got, the more of an asshole I became. But I was taking care of business. I was taking care of business, and it was working. It was working. It was it was going great. And I just felt like there was sometimes I just felt like I was invincible. You know, I'm high up on cocaine. I'm drinking. I got all these women that like me, and I thought that was that's my world, and I'm gonna let everybody know you can't fuck with my world. No matter yeah, you're you're well, you're you're representing the mo uh, mobsters. Exactly. And, yeah, yeah, you're a part of something. You know, I had some difficulties with uh, some of the people that I got involved with that were in the organization that did not like me, but the word was put out that I couldn't be touched. Of course, I was not Italian. I was not white. But but what these guys liked about me is that I was an earner and I was getting the fucking money. That's what they liked. And the guy that stood up for me most, of course, was Jimmy. Jimmy. Jimmy was, was the guy. They even, they even got to a point, Matt, that they sent me to Boston. Fucking believe it. They sent me to South Boston to meet with some people out there. Of course, I went with a few other guys, uh, a uh, Frank, Frankie, uh, uh, Joseph, we call him Big Joe, and uh, and Richie Bird. Richie Bird. Let me tell you a little about Richie Bird. Um, <clears throat> you remember uh, Sesame Street when we were kids, and they had Big Bird, the Yellow Bird. 
Yeah. The yellow hair all over the place. Richie, Richie was six foot five and he had this fucked up hair. I mean, it was like all over the place. So we started calling him Big Bird, Richie the Bird. And he was the guy that he was muscle. You know what I'm saying? This guy was, I mean, he was, he was bigger than me, but he wasn't muscular. He was just bright. Right. And he wasn't that bright, but he was, he was supposed to protect me when we would go out and do what we got to do. You know, he'd listen. I'd tell him to do whatever, but you got to, you know, you got to lead him to the horse to war. You got to lead him and tell him what to do. Right. You no. Know? And uh, we became really, really close. And uh, I love, I love Richie. One night, one night, um, we're in uh, uh, Sunset Park, Brooklyn. Sunset Park, that's Hispanic Park. It's like 30th Avenue and 38th Street. Okay. It's a data club there. One of the clubs I've been collecting from all the time. Okay. So we go there to, to, to collect money, hang out. And all of a sudden, you know, I'm getting high and I'm drinking. Richie's, Richie's sitting down, chilling. I go to the bathroom and then uh, I get uh, accosted, grabbed at the bathroom at gunpoint. Yeah, at gunpoint. And they're telling me to, to come out, come, don't just move, move, come out, come out, come outside. And I'm like, holy shit, right? And my fucking, my, I didn't even zip her up and we're, we're going out and they take me out to the back, okay? And they said, give us the money, give us the fucking money. And I knew that they were Spanish. I didn't turn around. I didn't turn around, but I could hear the accent. They were Hispanics. And they put the gun to my head and uh, I, gave, I gave them the money that I picked up. And then I said to myself, they're going to kill me. So I got I to gotta try something. I got to do something. So I turned around real quick, jumped on that guy. And I started hitting him. Then all of a sudden, I felt a real stick like this real quick. Boom. And uh, the guy stabbed me in, uh, in my chest. And uh, they got up. They, they took off. And I'm staggering. I don't know why I did this, and I wrote about this in my book. I started, the door you couldn't get back in because once it's an exit, you can't get back into the club. And I'm right. making music, whatever. And I started walking to the alley, to the alley towards the front of the, the, the club so I could try to get some help. For some strange reason, I walked into the street. The same guys that did that were in a car. They saw me walking. They ran me over with the fucking car. They hit me. Whoa. Paul, I was fucked up. Right? Like run over, run over, or hit you and you fell out of the way. And they hit me with the fucking car. And the next thing I know, I woke up about a month, a month later. I was in, a, was in a coma. I woke up. I was in Park Slope Hospital. Park Slope Hospital, Brooklyn, on 7th Day Avenue. And I had everything. I had tubes up my nose. I had tubes everywhere. I was like fucking Frankenstein. And uh, the first person that I see when I wake up was uh, my uh, uh, my mom. She was there. And uh, then I saw my girlfriend. She was there. And they start crying and stuff. And I couldn't talk or anything because they had these tubes and all kinds of shit. It took a few days uh, for me to... When I got into the coma, it takes a while for you to get all your shit back. Right. Okay. This is this is what happened. That's where I got stabbed. That's where I had open heart surgery. Oh, so the the knife hit the your heart. Hit, the knife. Let me tell you something, man. I learned a lot about the heart. Okay. What happened was when he stabbed me, he it nicked something called my left ventricle. Okay, you have a right ventricle and a left ventricle. Uh, one pumps the blood into your heart, and the other one pumps it through your system, to your brain, and all that kind of stuff. I had internal bleeding, internal hemorrhaging. Okay, well, but let me tell you the story prior to what's going on with this. When I get hit by the car, the EMS came. The EMS came, and they pronounced me dead at the scene because they didn't feel a pulse. They didn't feel no pulse on anything, so they put me in a fucking body bag. Whoa. Okay. They put me in the body bag. But here's the thing, right? Here's the thing. When they put me in a body bag, they didn't zip it all the way through the top. And I was getting air in there. And when they got now, this is what they told me. Of course, I was unconscious. They told me that when I when they when they got me to the hospital, the body bag was moving. And the guys, they the only they opened it up and they saw me breathing. 
and they ran me upstairs. Instead of bringing me to the morgue, they ran me upstairs to uh, to surgery. And uh, that's why they 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 cracked me open. They did all of that. Had my heart in the fucking hand. They did all this shit. Welded it. Did whatever they had to do to save my life. And but I was I was I was put in a forced coma because when the car hit me, they broke my ribs, broke my arm. Uh, I had multiple contusions in the head from being hit by the car. I was fucked up. You know what I'm saying? And uh, that's a story. This is the story uh, uh, that's in my trailer. It's actually in my trailer, my my, uh, my documentary trailer. My mother, my mother just loved telling that story. And my mother, uh, of course, she's she was just with her friends. She said, they put my baby in a body bag. She would tell my story about what happened. So over the years, I would laugh and I would hear my mom telling that story to her friends over the phone or whatever. So I, I, I pay homage to that. Right. The story of me being in a body bag, you know, because my mom, not that she loved the story. What my mother told me, what she loved about the story is that I survived. Yeah, of course. No, that's you know. She loved that part. So that's why she could tell all of that. You know what I'm saying? And to this day, even when I'm sleeping, I'm dreaming sometimes, I hear my mother telling that story to somebody because she told every fucking body about that story. But uh, to get back to what happened with me, um, after I, I got out of the coma and uh, they started pulling things out of me, they, they gave me the colotomy bag where you have to pee and everything and shit, whatever, all that kind of mess, whatever. Uh, uh, the doctors came in and told me that they repaired the, the left ventricle and I, and I said, I'm not, I said, I'm, I'm, I'm like fucking 22 years old. Like, am I going to be okay? And they said, yes, yes, yes. You're going to be fine. You got to be fine. It's, it's going to take time to see how everything goes. See if my heart swells up, see whatever. And, uh, and, uh, to this day, um, um, I, I, I owe a lot of thanks <clears throat> to that doctor at Park Slope Hospital. And I'll never forget what he said to me when I was leaving, when I was leaving that day, finally leaving the hospital. And uh, uh, I'm going down the elevator. Now, you got to say something. I wasn't graft for surgery. Sometimes they graft you for surgery to bypass uh, nerves and stuff like that. They did emergency open heart surgery. They just cut me open. So there's no feeling all on this. You could stick needles and all, whatever. It's dead. Right. Completely dead. You know what I'm saying? So so uh, I said to him, I said, thank you for saving my life. He says, no, I didn't, I, I didn't save your life. He goes, he points up to the sky. I said, that's who saved your life. And I was like, mm -hmm. thank you, doctor. I wasn't, yeah, I wasn't buying that. I wasn't, that's my mom's stuff. You know, I wasn't buying that. I was like, you, you repaired me. And, but it took, honestly, it took about, Jimmy came up to the hospital to see me. <clears throat> and uh, he said to me, um, he said to me, he goes, um, you know, you got to get out of this. He really, Jimmy fucking loved me, okay? Right. Jimmy fucking loved me, all right? He says, he says, this is, this is, I don't want you in this no more, you know? And of course, I, 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 I had second thoughts about everything that was going on, you know? Um, but then the police came. <laughs> the police came to the hospital before I was leaving. And then they they asked a lot of questions, and they want they they already knew what I was doing. They knew who I was. They, Tommy, we know who you are. We know what you're doing. We know about you. I mean, we know about every. We, they 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 know. They knew exactly what we were doing because they followed me that my life uh, since I was in the warlords to a crime in the neighborhood. They knew all about me, and they knew that I was in Manhattan. They knew I was working with Jimmy. Uh, they they took pictures of Jimmy and they 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 came to the hospital and showed me pictures of him and the guys that I was working with. These guys were on the case. Dude. They they knew what they were doing, you know. Or but you it, you didn't know you didn't know who robbed you anyway. Like I mean, yeah, the, right. Oh, you did. Oh, I thought you said I thought you were like they were. We found out later on it okay. was it was the club owners. Oh, was there. okay. So like we're gonna pay him and just steal, rob the money back. Exactly. It was that. They didn't want me uh, doing that anymore. They wanted to kill me. It was that. You know, we found that out later on. Even the police told us. The police, see the police, and Matt, you should know this. Um, when you're working a case like that and the cops are on the fucking case, the cops are going to try to get everybody against each other. And yeah. somebody talks, whatever the case. And they were saying, you know, you know Tommy, you, what are you, stupid? They set you up. The people that you were fucking robbing robbed you. 
Right. You know? And I'm like, I'm all fucked. And that's when I start acting like I'm fucked up. I'm like, oh, I'm sick. I'm still I'm not well. <laughs> you know, I, I used that for a while in the hospital because they didn't charge me with anything at that point. But uh, the jail comes later because obviously, you know, uh, I didn't leave um, Jimmy's. Uh, I didn't leave my work. But it took me, oh gosh, at least a year before I could, I had to go to physical therapy. I couldn't raise my arm because of the surgery from the stretch, from the, from the, from, from being all the way from cutting me open. I couldn't, I couldn't raise, I couldn't raise my arm. They said, I never lift, I never lift weights again. I'll never, you know, I defied all that. Right. I, I defied all of that. I started training myself again. I put this fucking uh, rubber expandable thing. Remember back in the day? Yeah, I, remember, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. 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 I bought that. I was using it. I was using that. And man, that worked wonders, man. That worked wonders. That took months, but I was able to. Uh, it took me about maybe four months, but I was able to lift my arm back over my head again. I was able to do that. And then I started hitting the heavy bag and all of that, and I, and I built, it was like a Rocky movie, man. I was building myself back up so I could get back to work. Right. So I can get back to my illegal activity. So I can get back to being this big shot of a guy. Because it didn't, the only thing that that did to me, honestly, was make me be more aware of my surroundings. Right, I realized you, were, you, were, you weren't, in, you weren't, you know, um, people could get to you realize people could get to you that you weren't you know that you can be big but the guy's got a knife or a gun or you know because i know you get to people get to that point where they feel like they're invincible you know exactly you're a teenager and you think that you get do oh well if i get into a car accident i'll just brace myself <laughs> what <laughs> whoa you know then you get older and you realize my god the kind of things you were doing when you were younger it's like yeah. And how old were you at that point? In your 20, early 21s? I was about 22 years old. Man. At that time. You know? Mm. At, um, my That's husband. That's a lot to go through at 21. Yeah. I just thought at that point, when I got better, um, I met this girl named Olga. Olga Figueroa. And um, I kind of fell in love with her. You know, kind of fell in love with a Spanish girl. And I got us a place uh, on McDowell Avenue in Brooklyn. And uh, she had two kids already, uh, Johnny and Keisha. She had two kids already. Now, I didn't have any, I didn't have any kids. You know what I'm saying? And I have no kids, but she had two. But she was just beautiful, Hispanic woman. I was like, oh my God, this woman is gorgeous. And uh, we moved in together. And things were good for a while. You know, I wasn't, Jimmy was giving me money and I wasn't doing anything for a while. But uh, when I got real, when I got better, I mean real better, and uh, I wanted to get back to work, I just told her that I'm a, I'm a bouncer at a club in, in Manhattan. You know, she didn't really know what I was doing. I said, I bounced a club in Manhattan. But I was actually, uh, at that point, we had the F train that was right in front of our home on McDonald Avenue, the F train. And I would just go downstairs, jump, get on the F train, and go straight to 14th Street to the club. And that was that. That's what I was doing every night. But she she got kind of wise because I was putting a lot of money. Remember, remember drop ceilings, <laughs> drop yeah. ceilings. We had a drop ceiling in our in our bedroom, and she would see me going up into it all the time. And I get a box, and she went in there one day. And discovered a lot of fucking cash. Right. A lot of cash. And when I got back to the house, we sat down. And she goes, what are you doing? How much are they paying you? You know, what are you doing? And I told her, I said, I'm, look at me. I said, look, I'm, I'm doing a lot of protection. I, I protect everybody at the club. I'm making a lot of money. And then I got to a point where I said, listen, it's none of your fucking business. Okay? That's the point that I got. To, it's none of your business. I'm paying the fucking bills here. Okay? I'm taking care of your kids. That's the attitude that I got. If you don't like it, go live with your mother. That's the way I started treating her. Yeah, that's not a winning. Uh, that's not a winning relationship. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, no strategy, by the way. No, no, it's not. It's not. And so again, uh, something something bad happened again. Um, 
I was at this, uh, stopped at this bodega. You know bodegas, right? Yeah. Bodegas, Spanish stores, right? It was on, uh, gosh, what was that on? Um, Church Avenue in Brooklyn. And I got out the car. I was with uh, this guy named John. And, and a matter of fact, Joe was there too. Joey was there. And uh, we were drinking or whatever. Nothing, I wasn't heavily fucked up. But there was a bunch of Hispanics outside the store. And uh, I know that store sells drugs. There's this guy that worked at, uh, his name was Chicky. And he actually had one eye. He had one eye. It was a glass eye, whatever. Because every time he fucking look at you, it looked like he's looking the other fucking way. I used to make fun of that guy. But, but when I'm coming out the store, I went to buy some beer. I come out the store. One of the Spanish guys says something to me. And he looked kind of familiar to me, you know? And he says something. I said, why don't you speak fucking English? What the fuck are you talking about? And uh, the crazy thing was everything happened so fast. Um, he came towards me. And I yelled out to 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 the guys, and we're fighting. We're, we're fighting in front of the fucking store, and we're whipping their ass. Next thing you know, Tiki comes running out the fucking store, shooting, fucking shooting, and I started running, and he's trying to aim for me because he's hitting the cars, and uh, he sh he shot me in the back. And my friend, my friend Neil was there. Neil was that's right. Neil was there. Uh, Neil got stabbed twice. Um, Neil got stabbed in the gut, and he got stabbed in the back because he had jumped on Chicky when Chicky was shooting. After Chicky shot me, and they stabbed him twice. Neil, to this day, to this day, I still talk to Neil. He had been right since that thing happened to him. Uh, did a he has to go for transfusions every few months or whatever. It's all kinds of crazy shit. Because they, they, they when, when they when they when they stabbed him, his intestines and everything got all fucked up. They had to cut him short and all this kind of craziness. And 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 Neil wasn't part of what I was doing. Neil was just a friend from the street. Right. Neil wasn't involved in my chaos. That guy was one of the guys that I used to collect money from from the clubs in Sunset and uh, in Sunset Park because I went to quite a few clubs and he recognized me. That's what the police had told me again. That's what happened there. What happened with those guys? The police grab them, or well, well, there was charges filed. Charges were filed, and uh, all I can say is that they found Chick Chicky's body in a in a garbage container about six weeks later. Why did he shoot you? Like he why? Why? Shoot me. No, I know he was. He was. You said he was trying. Well, well, why? Why you? Why not the other guy? Yeah, he knew who I was, and he never liked me. I never liked him because I know that he sold drugs to kids and shit. You know what I'm saying? I wasn't with that drug shit. He knew who I was, and those were people that were his friends. They were his friends. They were his friends. Okay. So when that shit, when I started whooping their ass, you know, he ran out with the fucking gun. Yeah, well, that makes sense. that makes sense. They were together. He yeah. knew them. Yeah. The police, uh, the police came to question me about his death. You know, they. You know, they thought I had some involvement with it or something. And, uh, you know, which I didn't. And uh, he won't be missed. That's all I could say about him. He won't be missed. I understand. But uh, at that point, when I was in the hospital, I went to Maimonides Hospital at that time, the Jewish hospital. And my girlfriend, Olga, came up to see me. And she said to me, I'll never forget this. I wrote this in my book. She said to me, I wish you would die already. Because I'm tired of worrying about you. Mm -hmm. She said that to me. And when she said it to me, it, did it change me a little bit? Did it work out for us? I was when I was shot. Uh, it was it was a non-threatening uh, uh, with a bullet went. It was non-threatening. They just they just took it out uh, that evening at the hospital, and uh, had to put it in for evidence, whatever against. Chicky, I think his name was Rudolph something. His real name, I don't, I don't remember. But everybody called him Chicky. To this day, I don't even know why they call him fucking Chicky. But I know he was a drug dealer. But uh, I was fine. But Neil was. He stayed in the hospital for like two months. No, he was in pretty bad shape. I go visit him, and then I get into 
arguments with his father and stuff like that. You know, you you don't need to be around my son and shit like that. Whatever, you know, all that kind of bullshit, whatever. I love Neil, you know. To this day, uh, he's not he's not even uh you wanna hear the crazy thing? This is a crazy thing. Uh, Neil became a fucking corrections officer. He became a corrections officer at Rikers Island. I'd see him there when I get arrested. <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying? Um, he'd bring me extra stuff, you know, cigarettes, totally whatever. He, he'd do that for me. But uh, yeah, um, to this day, I, uh, uh, he's he's just what what fucked Neil up mostly <clears throat> was the 14 years that he worked here, fucking Rikers Island. Because when I talked to him, you know, he's just. He lives back in the day. He always goes back to that day. Tommy, if we'd have done this that night, if we'd have done whatever, he's always living. I try to say, you know, Neil, it's old, just forget it. But he's not, he's not, yeah, he's not all claiming full deck anymore, you know. But I still call him occasionally just to check on him, you know, just to check on him. But uh, again, got out of the hospital. I was only in the hospital for like three days. And I went to see Jimmy. And uh, things were changing for Jimmy. Um, um, AIDS came out AIDS and it yeah. affected the S and M clothes. So this is in, in the mid to late eighties? Yes. 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 And uh that was a big change. And I remember I remember this very, very, very clear. When Jimmy used to meet with the bosses, right? There's this restaurant that was on the corner of 14th Street and 9th Avenue. The clubs across the street. And there's this restaurant, uh, a dive bar. Took up the whole corner. You could actually smoke in the fucking restaurant at that time. Right. Because Jimmy was a fucking chain smoker and he drank scotch all the time. And we would sit there and we would talk. He's waiting for the bosses to come talk to him. And he's telling me, tell me, please, mm. you need to, I, I, I want to go to California. Do you want to come with me? Oh, I, I got to get, he was like, he was scared. <laughs> it was like, he was scared. And I'm like, I, I, I mean, Jimmy, I said, what's going on? Eh, things are changing, you know, things are changing, you know, this AIDS thing and all this, whatever. Business is slow. <clears throat> he's not earning. He's not making enough money for them. And they're all not happy with him and all this kind of shit, you know? And uh, <clears throat> I knew something was wrong. You know, um, he, here's the thing. Of course, being African-American, I'm, uh, I'm not going to be a made guy and all of that loudest. That, that's not happening. That's, that never even crossed my mind. I just wanted to earn money and try to save money and try to do better with my life. I started changing a little bit. I don't want to do this anymore. I've been wounded so many times. I'm like, they're going to kill me. They're going to kill me. That's what's going to happen. Bottom line to that is one day the, uh, uh, I made a collection. I made a collection off of this Italian guy in Brooklyn. Italian guy. I'm not even going to say his name. He was a connected guy, right? He didn't have the money on him that evening. So I took everything that he had. I took all his jewelry and I took his fucking car. Right? Okay. Next thing that I knew, I was arrested. I got arrested. They came for me. And uh, they put me in cuffs. They said, Tom, you have no clue who you fuck with last night. And I said, what are you talking about? Of course, I didn't. I got in contact with Jimmy. got an attorney, all this kind of shit. Jimmy told me not to worry about it, right? Uh, but uh, they charged me with uh, a strong arm robbery and a few other counts of strong arm robbery that people uh, called in about. Now, when people listen, uh, when people don't have the money to pay me that they're supposed to pay, right? Right? I'll take something off their person, right there, or I'll take their keys to their car, you know. And plus, I went to a lot of meat stores on Flatbush Avenue. Meat stores. There was a lot of meat stores on Flatbush Avenue. And I was uh, going in there, taking meat, and I was making them pay me for protection. A uh, few of these people, uh, 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 Jimmy had Jimmy had locked down a few of the meat places there, but I went out on my own and I did a few other things on my own as well. You know, so my world started to collapse. And I was facing time and uh, the judge told me that uh, he's going to give me uh, 4 to 12. Okay. Um, what did your lawyer say? The lawyer said that I had, I had had multiple multiple charges. It's, 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 a, it's a lot more. Than, uh, you say, are these guys? I mean, like, are, are these people like? If you go to trial, like they'll show up. Oh yeah, some of them will. Some of them won't. 
Right. Me and Jimmy, this is the bottom line. Jimmy actually came with me and we spoke to the attorney ourselves. And they, they knocked it down to a, a, a two to four. You know what I'm saying? I could be out within two years. So I if took you behave yourself. If I behave myself, I took it. Right. I took it. Where'd you go? I went to Rikers Island C74. But so you got to understand something. When they arrested me and they, they held me without bond, I was fighting the case. This was going on for a while because I didn't want to do fucking 12 years, right? Wow. So we were fighting the case, trying to get them, the district attorney, to, to uh, you know, they tried to get me uh, for racketeering as well. You know, Rico, they wanted to get me for big stuff and make me a federal, make a federal, you know? So we wheeled and dealed, and and I got to say, Jimmy, and I, to this day, Jimmy stuck it through with me and helped me with money, attorneys and stuff, and uh, uh, was knocked out to four years. Now, when I was in C-74 on Rikers Island, fighting my case, that's when I, I not, time had went by and I haven't seen Neil. I haven't hung out with Neil for a while. I stayed away from him. You know, time went by, a couple went, went by. I was doing my own thing. And I see him in a fucking uniform at the fucking jail. I'm not kidding. I'm not, I'm not making this shit up. And I, I, were you, were you, is that like a, you start laughing or you just, how's that? How did that work? Like mixed, mixed emotions, you know, yeah. he doesn't want to, he, as an officer, it's not like he wants to be like, Hey bro, what's going on? Like no, no, really... he, pulled me out of, he pulled me out of line in the, in the hallways. He made us not supposed to talk with each other when they're walking, when the guards, Neil pulled me out to the side and said, Tommy, what's going on? I told him, well, what's going on with, what dorm I was in, whatever. He says, okay, just just be cool, just be cool. I'll come up there and I'll see you. That's what he said to me. And then we're back about my business because I was going to chow. You know what I'm saying? I was like, I said, there was a damn good. I guess somebody could bring me some shit. You know what I'm saying? And then uh, uh, after I made the plea deal with them, they sent me up to uh, a place called the, they said, they said, you could do a shock treat, a shock camp. I said, what the fuck is that? He says, you could do the shock camp. You could be out in, uh, I think, six to eight months. It didn't work. I went to the, I went to the shock camp. I was, I was getting a lot of fights. I was fighting everybody. What is that? That's like a boot camp, right? Where it's like, yeah, it was a boot like, camp. Like, like very... Yeah, it was like a boot camp. But I got it. I'm going to tell you a little, tell you a little story of what happened on Rikers Island. Okay. Um, I was in C74 and the building was infested with Bloods and Crips. Okay. These black gang, Bloods and Crips. Yeah. Okay. They wanted me to get to join up with them to be in the gang, the Bloods and the Crips. I had a cellmate. <laughs> this is kind of funny. His name was Black because this motherfucker was black as the ace of fucking spades. Okay. He's a black motherfucker. I mean, black like this. And they called him Black. I wanted to make my time easy while I was there waiting to be sent upstate. So I took a job in a visiting room, you know, the VI room, call it the VI room. And I was handed out the orange. Now, at that time at C74, you can wear your, your civvies in jail, but when you go to on a visit, you have to put on the orange jumpsuit. They got it reversed, but that's the way they fucking do it there at that time. You put on an orange jumpsuit for your visits. Okay? So they were bringing in drugs from the visiting room, the inmates. Check this shit out. It was so simple, right? This is in 1990, 1992. The, the, the civilians were in the visiting room and there were garbage cans all around before they had to go through the metal detector and be searched. They were dropping their drugs in the garbage pails. Guess who was cleaning the garbage pails? Yeah, right. The fucking inmates. It was they go they get the dope, stuff it up their ass, and go back into the you know to the to the VI room, whatever. I found out what they were doing in there, and they wanted me to partake in that shit, the bloods. And I told them, "Fuck you! I ain't getting involved in that shit." And they and uh, one of them called me a white boy <laughs> because of the way I talk. He said, you're a white boy. You need to sound black, bro. And this guy must have been about five foot six, right? Telling me this shit. And meanwhile, he had like, I don't know, 10 or 15 guys with him, whatever the case. But he's telling me this, this fucking little guy telling me this shit. And I and I and I had it out with him right there, right there on the spot, you know. A, a small fight broke out at that point, and the, the officer said, I'll give you 60. 
give us a minute to fight. And I tore up some ass. I tore up some fucking ass there. I got kind of caught up in whatever, but I tore some ass up. But I, I couldn't go back to the fucking uh, 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 upper, to my, to my, to, to, to the dorm. I couldn't go back there because the cat was out of the bag. In other words, what happened was when, when, when I didn't want to help them do, bring the drugs in, they threatened me. And they threatened me and said, go on, go back to yourself. We're going to kill you when you get back there. That's what right. they were telling me. So I was like, damn. We had that fight. The officers, see, the officers knew that I wasn't down with that bullshit. They knew who I was and how I was. Tony ain't down with that little gang bullshit, whatever. You know, he's a, bigger than that, right? And I, I said to myself, you know what? I know exactly what the fuck I'm going to do. I said, I'm going to talk to the warden. I want to talk to the warden. I dropped the dime. Right. Transfer it. I said, listen, I'll tell you how these guys are getting the fucking drugs in there if you transfer me. He said, tell me how. I said, no, transfer me first. Transfer me out of this fucking building. Get my shit. And then I'll tell you. He did that. The warden, let me tell you something. The warden knows each and every fucking inmate. I ain't bullshit. They fucking know who's who and what's what. They know all that shit. And when I went to his fucking office, he did call me Harding. He called me Harding all the time. He goes, Harding, I'm going to transfer you. They transferred me within an hour. I was out of that building, and they sent me to OBCC, this other building. The warden from that building came over to talk to me, and I told them how they were getting the drugs at. The next day, they raided and arrested everybody. And they came to tell me. And they thanked me. They fucking thanked me for dropping the fucking diet. Right. And then two days later, I was transferred upstate. I was happy that fucking shit. Man, you you know this, that shackle, fucking six hour fucking drive. You gotta make sure you, you don't have to take a dump or pee or whatever before you get on that fucking bus. Try to eat a bologna sandwich oh, all. Fuck, man. Yeah. It was horrible. But it was also a good thing because better food. You don't have people that just came right off the street, you know? Yeah. Can I time the whole time I was, you know, locked up in the marshal's holder, like everybody kept saying, Man, I, I just want to get sentenced to go to prison. And I used to think prison, like that's where it's really bad. And they're like, Bro, you get ice cream, oh, uh, yeah. you're on channel, you get, you know, you're like, What? They're like, You get into a good routine, you can go work out, you can be outside, you can Exactly. Exactly. Because they sent me to the shock incarceration camp first upstate, and they said you could be out in eight months. I got into too many fights over there, and then they said, they said, well, you got to go back to real jail and finish off your time. and send me to fucking real jail because that shock incarceration shit, motherfuckers yelling in my face and shit. I was like, get the fuck out of here. I mean, fuck you. Just calling my mother a whore and shit. And then I, uh, you know, they were trying to put me on charges because I punched the guard because he called my mother a whore. He said, where's your mother a whore, a junkie, all this shit? I wasn't having that shit. You know, and they put me in a fucking, the bang, you know, the bang up there. And with the bang? The box. Oh, yeah, the shoe. The, the, box had, the shoe. Yeah, special housing, whatever. Yeah, and that was special. I was there a lot, man. I was just, I was very angry. And, you know, then all of a sudden I find out that Jimmy got killed. He was murdered. Yeah, he got murdered. Yep. Jimmy you got think murdered. because he owed money? For this day, to this day, Matt, I don't. The only thing that I can think of, honestly, the only thing that I could possibly think of is that they killed Jimmy because they didn't need him anymore and he knew too much. And I thought that was going to happen. Jimmy wanted me out because, Tommy, you got to get out because, first of all, you know, they'll kill you first. You know, Jimmy was telling me this all. When we're sitting down, and Jimmy loves to drink, have his coffee, have his scotch, his cigarette. And he was a 70s type of guy. And and he would just say, Tommy, we got to get out of this. They're going to kill us. We got to get out of this. We got to change our lives. You know what I'm saying? And I have listened to him sometimes, you know. And when I found out that he died, I, I was sad as a motherfucker, man. I actually cried. I did, man. I was sad. Because uh, Jimmy, and the way that he died, they, they, they found him in the trunk of a car. That's been there for, I don't know, he must have been dead for a couple of months in the car, maybe a month or two. Um, and I never, what you know what I really hated? I, I never met anybody from his family. You know, he only had uh, uh, this girlfriend, a young girl, actually, because Jenny at that time was in his 50s, and his girlfriend was like 26 or something. 
And and uh, I went to see her uh, when I when I when I initially got back out. But uh, yeah, that was a hard time for me because he he treated me good, and he made he he told me that you know my mother was uh, uh, didn't need to be treated like that from the father. And Jimmy didn't like Jimmy did not like the way that my father was, obviously. And let me tell you something. I think Jimmy thought of sometimes about having him killed or something. I'm not kidding you because when Jimmy would start thinking about my father and the way they was treating us, and I stopped telling Jimmy what was going on in my house because I didn't want him to kill my father, you know, because uh, uh, Jimmy knew people that would do shit like that. You know what I'm saying? So, but uh, uh, part of me left that day. And that was when I said that was enough. So when they when they let me out, they let me out uh, 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 1993, the end of 1993, and I was supposed to report to my parole officer. Right? Um, I don't know why the fuck I did this shit. I don't know. I was I was angry. Whenever. Did it report? What? No, I didn't even fucking show up. I didn't <laughs> fuck it. I went out and I hung out with my friends and got drunk and party with some girls. A few days after that, um, I, the address that I used was uh, my mother's address, the house that I actually, the apartment that I actually got for her. The police came looking for me. Uh, the parole officer came looking for me. And uh, uh, my mother at that time, here's the crazy thing. My sister got herself clean. Renee got herself clean. And she moved to a place called Fable, North Carolina. I'd never been to North Carolina. And uh, 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 my mother went to Fable, North Carolina because she got sick a little bit. She got sick. And they were gone. And I said to myself, I called my mom. I said, Ma, I'm coming to North Carolina because I'm on the run now. I'm on the run. So I left towards the end of 1993 and I ended up at a place called Fayetteville, North Carolina, where Fort Bragg was. Never been there. I got I took the fucking Amtrak train. <laughs> and I got off in this town. I was like, what the fuck is this? It was like, now you know how Grand Central Station is in New York City. Thousands of people, trains, everything. I get off in this one gas station fucking town, Fave. I'm like, this is perfect, <laughs> you know? And I never, ever, ever in my life lived in a trailer. I didn't even know where a fucking trailer was until I went to my sister's house. And she was living in a single wide trailer with my mom. And then I had to find something to do. What am I going to do right. that? What am I going to do now? I was on the run. I started bouncing clubs out here. And now, I'm not in North Carolina now. I'm in Texas, but. I started bouncing clubs, strip bars, and I'm a one fugitive. Okay, I'm a one fucking fugitive. And I don't tell nobody who I am, nothing, zero, nothing. And I was really good. I was getting paid good money. I was fucking rolling. People like me. I was like, oh, man, it's that guy that called me New York. I said, don't call me New York. Because <laughs> you know, my accent, they'll start calling me New York. I said, don't call me New York. You call me Tommy. Just call me Tommy. You know what, New York. Right? And things were going good. Uh, things were going great. Uh, it's been five years. We're in 1998. Five years past that I'm on a fugitive. Five years. I'm in 1998. I get myself involved with one of the dancers at the club. Her name is Marion. German chick. Right? And I'm banging a hot chick. I'm banging her. One day she comes to me and says, I'm pregnant. Mm. I say, get the fuck for real? Holy shit. You want an abortion? <laughs> nope, she wasn't having that. So she was fucking pregnant, man. She was pregnant. Now, here's another story that I got to tell you about. Something that 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 involves my brother Violis, my brother Vito. He's still in he's still in jail right now. He's been in there for 22 years. Oh, yeah. He's going to a wife. Yeah. What happened was to make a long story short, because my shit is long. Is if I have to, it'll take hours and hours for me to, to get into all of this. I met this woman. I met this woman in Fayetteville, North Carolina, prior to marrying. Her name is Billy. Billy was a madam here. Okay. She was a madam. She had uh, she had multiple escort services. Okay, and she was a German chick, and she ran her shit like a well oiled fucking machine. She had a beautiful home. She had a, 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 a nail, a couple of nail and tanning salons in town. She had money, and she wanted. And I wanted to date this girl, <laughs> and I did. I dated her. And and uh, the, the 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 bottom line to that was I was seeing how her operation was working. She was running, she was laundering the prostitution money 
through the fucking salon. She was running it through the salons. Right. Alex would call her and they would use their credit cards to charge it, but she would charge it to Ultimate Concepts, the fucking goddamn nail salons, but it was a prostitution call. That's how she was laundering her fucking money. Right. The, these guys didn't even get in trouble with their wives because they, they would question them, what were you doing that Ultimate Concepts? Oh, it's good. I'm just getting the, like, you know, my, my nails done. I'll put it up. <laughs> oh, tanning. She had tanning there too as well. And masseuse there, massage stuff there, and all of that kind of shit. So me and her hit off, and I moved in with her. We dated for a while. And, and I still was bouncing the clubs. And that's when I met Marion. And I was banging Marion and banging her at the same, banging the other girl at the same time. That's how I was. Sue me. Yeah, that's how it was. I, I was just, I was a dog. You know? Billy found out about uh, Marion and wanted me out of the house. You know, so the party was over. But 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 something happened. Um something bad tragically happened a little later. But uh, I'm trying to narrow it down. Um So the you were saying Marion got pregnant. Yeah, yeah, with my daughter. My daughter she's twenty four. Actually I spoke to my daughter the other day, she's twenty four right now. And um I didn't want to be with Mary. I didn't want nothing I didn't want to be with the you know, I didn't want to be with her. So I tried I tried to do the right thing. Yeah. You know, I got us an apartment. I, I tried to do the right thing. I just, I just couldn't stand her. She got on my fucking nerves. Okay, I just didn't want to be with her, right? So uh, uh, I went back again. I was bouncing. I went back again with with uh, with uh, uh, with Billy, and I was work. I went back to the clubs. I'm working the clubs, and and one night, um, um, this guy approaches me. Uh, his name is Troy Thompson, and he asks him. Um, he's he's been watching me work all the time. And I wrote about this in my book. He, he, he says to me, um, hey, man, would you? how much they they pay you here? And I said, you know, about $250 a night. He says, I'll double that if you come work with me. I said, what do you do? He goes, I'm a bell bars, man. I'm looking for some skips, and I can use it to cut your size. Nice. That's what changes my, that changed my whole life when we had that conversation. That changed my whole life. And he doesn't run you. He doesn't run you to see no. if you're, Wow. No, he didn't. No, but this is what happened. This is what happened. I go back to fucking, I go back to, 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 to Marion's house to get stuff or whatever. And, uh, she had to go to the store. She had to go to the store. So I, I got in the car with her to go to the store. The next thing you fucking know, fucking we we're bombarded by police cars. I mean, they just fucking got us. They, they rolled in on me guns pointed out and all this stuff and she's crying i said bitch you turned me in no that's they're her they're there for her right no they were there for me oh really yeah they were there for me because he, he pulled up my shirt and saw my name on my chest said there's tommy arnie he pulled this up and says there's tommy arnie that's him right there and he put me in handcuffs and he arrested me and they wow. took me to Cumberland county jail in fayetteville I was on the run for five years. They caught me in 1998. Transferred me back to Rikers Island. They flew me. These fucking cops flew me to fucking uh, New York. Well, how did they get you? Who turned you in? Like how? They got me because of what happened was Billy that owned the escort service. My brother Beyotis came down, right? My brother Beyotis came down. He opened up an escort service himself. And he was doing a lot of illegal activity. They surveillanced his house. I went to his house. They took pictures of me. And they ran me. They found out they had warrants. I'm wanted in New York. Okay. And that's how I wound up. But that did me a favor, Matt. That cleared everything up. I went to, they took me back to New York City. I went back to fucking, they put me at C95 this time. C95. I stayed there. I was there for about, the, the FBI questioned me. Everybody. You were questioning me about homicides, Jimmy, fucking all this shit. I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what you're talking about. I, I don't, I don't know anything. I don't know nothing. They even questioned me again about Chicky's death, all this kind of fucking shit. And 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 one thing I'll say: if you just keep your mouth shut, you'll stay the fuck out of trouble. Right. right? That's what Jimmy always used to tell me. Don't say nothing. I never said anything, and it kept me there for like a fucking year, dude. Until they just had to release me. They let me go. They let me go towards uh, 2000. They let me go. 
they let me go, man. So what what did you did you go back? I went back to fucking Fagel, North Carolina. Guy. But when I was in jail, I was in contact with Billy. Billy came to visit me. She flew to fucking Rikers Island to visit me. And she was sending me money. So she right. was my girlfriend. And all that time that happened, my daughter was born in 1999. My daughter, Portia, was born in 1999. So I went back to Billy's house in Fayetteville. I made contact with, with Marion. I said, I'm going to see my daughter. And she had no problem with me. She says, you can come by and see your daughter. And so Billy's telling me, yeah, yeah go, you can go see your daughter. I trust you. Get a kid. So I go, I, I, go to, I go to see my daughter. And of course, she's an infant. And it was nice seeing her. And Marion, Marion comes out like she wants me to fuck her. Right. <laughs> and I said, no. Fuck that. I'm not, mm, I'm gonna, uh, no, thank you. No. No, I just want to see my daughter. That's it. And from that point on, you know, I just was with Billy until, and then, all right, now we're getting to the to to, to the stuff in the book. When I when I was staying with Billy, I had to find something else to do. I got back in contact with Troy Thompson, the Bell right. Bell the Bell Law Bosman, and I went to his office and I happened to meet somebody named Brian and Crystal that that were with him also. And and Troy and his and his and his wife Jennifer, all four of these people. And they all took a liking to me. And we were going over cases, and I was like, oh man, I know how to I know how to go through cases. I've been through my, my whole fucking life. I know how to do all that shit, you know, the mugshot, you know, the people that they're involved with, the uh, the family members, all this kind of shit. And let me tell you something. That we went on a hunt and uh 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 I we arrested somebody, but but here, here's the thing. My first, I'll never forget my first, and I'll never forget my last. All the ones number three, I can't remember. We were looking for this black guy in favor of North Carolina. His bond was about $50,000. And they told me to give me $1,500. Did you give me $1,500 for this shit? Fuck yeah. I said, we're out by the house, and we're looking at the house. Wait, we want to. We have to make sure we confirm it's him. We don't want to grab somebody that's not him. Right. So what we did was, we couldn't tell. It was kind of dark. I said, I'm going to get out. Because they know what Troy looks like, because Troy's the one that bonded him out. I said, I'm going to walk by him. And if that's him, I'm going to grab him. Okay. So I get out the car and I make myself nonchalant. And I come all the way around. And he's out there talking to two other people. And I knew it was fucking him. He had that fucking, that this little tattoo uh, big X on his head. At that, that point, I just grabbed him. I fucking yoked him down to the fucking ground. Scared the hell out of the other two guys. They just put their fucking hands up like this. Troy and Chris and I ran from across the street, guns out. They didn't know who the fuck we were. And uh, we put him in handcuffs. I pulled them up. And that was him. Trusted that's him. And that was the first one the guy I've ever arrested as being a bounty hunter. And it was the last one. So how, how, how long did the bounty hunter thing last? Oh, that lasted like 14 years. Oh, my God. Yeah, I did that for 14 years. Mm-hmm. It- so well, why did it get out? Was, what happened was uh, I got so good at it. I, I I went to New Jersey. I wanted to learn more about this, right? So I took a, a a tracing course in New Jersey, and they licensed you in New Jersey, and that's where I got this. See that behind me? Yeah. See that behind me on the wall? Yeah, I saw. I saw that. It's a badge, yeah. the handcuffs, and the ID of B. When I took that class. That's the badge that I used for 14 years as a bounty hunter. And those are the very same handcuffs that I never lost since I've been doing that job. Never lost my handcuffs. It didn't matter that you were a, a felon, but you can't have a gun, right? No, I can't have a gun, but I carried one anyway. <laughs> I rather, listen, listen, let me say this. I'm going to be honest with you. I wrote about this in my book. I'd rather be uh, a judge by 12 than carried by six. Right. Okay. Because a lot of times, you, you got to say something. When I took that course, I took this course, it was like a, a two week course out in New Jersey about tracing, about all kinds of ways to, to get into a house and all kinds of shit, finagle on the phones at that time, whatever. And I was really good. I got so good, I didn't need uh, Troy anymore. I didn't need Crystal or Brian. I formed my own crew. And I got myself licensed through the insurance company itself because they knew that I was the one that was doing the pickups. I was covering their ass. So I got a contract. When I got the contract, they were sending me the skips. 
to my house. Right. Fucking thick envelopes, cases to work. And every case that I worked, I made sure that I made a deal with the certain bond person, the bonds person that owned that, that I would take 10 to 15% of the bond if I captured the individual and do an off bond. I got really good at it. Half of this, the sheriffs out here in, uh, in, uh, in uh, North Carolina, they knew who I was. They knew I was an ex-con, and they were loving me for bringing these motherfuckers to their jail. They let me sign the off bond myself. And I wasn't even a bail bondsman. I was just a licensed bounty hunter. I wasn't right. a bail bondsman. In the state of North Carolina, only a bail bondsman can do what's called a surrender and an off bond. They were letting me do it because I'm getting these guys that they couldn't catch. And it just blew up. It got all big. Why did you still? Why did you stop doing that? They're, um, they're still. They still have c- criminals. Criminals are still running away. Well, I'm going to tell you something. This book, if you read my book, I'm going to give you a copy of my book. You got to read my book. All right. Yeah, I will give you everything. But one of the reasons why, I'll tell you now, one of the reasons why I, I gave it up, there was a time in my life, I just I never got my education, man. Okay, I never finished school. Never went to college. Never did any of that shit because my dad was a drunk. I had a crazy life as a teenager. I've been in juvie halls, jails, all that stuff. And I wanted to focus on myself. So what I what happened was after I broke off with Bonnie, I mean Billy, and broke off with uh Marion, I was on my own. I was on my own, I was by myself. And then I and then I met this woman uh by the name of Susan, Susan Belly, I could say that, Susan Belly. Uh and uh she had a club uh in, in Fayetteville. And we just was friends. We weren't intimate. We were just friends. And she was telling me this story about this little boy, a nephew. Um, she was saying, yeah, Tommy, um, she's real country too. I can't do her accent, but she's real country. And she was like, well, uh, my, my, my daughter, my daughter-in-law, you know, stuff like that, had this uh, uh, little boy born. He was born as a, a, a child that was addicted to, to, to crack. He was born. The mother was a, his mother Sherry, was a was a crack user, and the father was a drug user, and the boy was born on that stuff. He had, they were making sure that he didn't have any problems from being born on that, you know, and she, uh, managed to get, uh, uh parental rights, um, to go to court for them because he didn't want she Susan didn't want that little boy to be raised by them because they were on drugs, so she took them to court. She won that first battle, and then I happened to meet her, and then she told me about the little boy, and I said, can I meet this little boy? Because it reminded me, of, I was just, I'm like, I want to meet this little boy, and his name was Nikki. I said, I got to meet this little boy, and a uh, couple of days go by, I told her to meet me at the park, this park that's in Fayetteville, and she came to the park, and Nikki was two years old when I first met him, and I don't want to get all teary eyed and stuff, right, but. She ran the little boy to the park, and I saw him as the cutest fucking little thing I've ever seen in my life. And and he was his coming into this world. He didn't ask to be addicted to that stuff. He didn't ask for these these uh, parents that they give a shit about him. So so I was playing with him in the park, and I asked her, "Hey, can you can you meet me here again a couple of days from now? I wanna I wanna I wanna I wanna teach you how to ride a little bike. I wanna do these things with him. I wanna do stuff with him." And I kept doing more stuff for him, more stuff for him. I get him a basketball, this and that, whatever. And the next thing you know, I told her, I said, uh, a couple of months gone by, I said, you want to move in with me? Let's let's raise this kid. Let's raise this boy. I want to raise, I want to raise this kid. And she thought I was crazy. She thought I was insane. I said, no, I want to raise this kid. And I want to protect him. I, my job from that point on, was to raise that little boy and make sure no fucking harm comes to him. He's not going to end up like me. Okay, that's what I. That was a promise to myself. Me and Susan, we got in the, we got a, we got a house, but we weren't together. You gotta understand, we were not together. We we're not intimate. Right. I just wanted to raise this kid, this little boy. And me and her went back and forth to court to get those parental rights taken away from the parents. 
which we were successful because I helped pay for the attorneys and stuff. And we were successful. We got their parental rights taken away. And me and Susan adopted him. <laughs> now, let me show you something. Hold on a second. You got to see this. Now, a little bit. Hang on a second. Okay. This is Nikki. He's 18 years, he's 19 years old now. He's going to college. This is my son, Nicholas. Nice. And he just graduated high school, and the college just won him all over North Carolina because of his football status. And he's his GPA is incredible. That's my son that I adopted. That's why I stopped bounty hunting. I went back to school. I got a grant. I went back to school. I I took my uh, GED. I passed my GED in 2013. After I, I said I wanted more. After I got my GED, I wanted to go to college. I said, what am I going to do at college? What do I like? What am I going to do at college? Oh, I love cars and motorcycles. So I took the automotive program and I got my associate's degree in automotive technology. And I walked across the stage with my son in the audience and a cap and a gown and a graduated college. Yep, that's what happened with Nicholas and me. And uh, Susan, actually, me and her, we, when Nikki got old enough, she got her own place, I got my own place, and now we share him. Like she calls me all the time, oh, Nikki, actually right now, Nikki's in the Bahamas right now. He's in the Bahamas, because we, we got him, uh, his friends from, from, from school senior class, we pay for his way to go to, to the Bahamas, and he's having a blast right now. So, wow. yeah. That's why I stopped bounty hunting, because I wanted to be, I wanted to get my education, and I opened up a business. I opened up a, a car business uh, uh, in, uh, in North Carolina. Uh, mechanics? Uh, yeah. yeah, I had a shop, and I was selling cars, and uh, uh, I sold a lot of cars, man. I was selling cars, bikes parts you name it I, I had a i had a house out in lumberton north carolina and i had it all i mean i had it was it was great and i i had so many cars i didn't know what to do with them you know and then i decided one day i, I had to write my story so i wrote it took me about seven years seven years to to write this right it took seven years to write it but here's the crazy thing when i finished writing it I didn't do anything. I let it sit for 15 years. A buddy of mine in, uh, in uh, Florida named Lorenzo Munez, he's a promoter out there. He does shows and stuff, you know, big time shows. And I went out there to see a show. And we're hanging out in his office. And I think I told you this. We're hanging out in his office. And we just started talking, small talk. And I said, yeah, man, I wrote my life. Because Lorenzo knew about my life. I was a criminal. He knew all that stuff. I said, I wrote about it. He says, really? I said, yeah, I wrote about it. He says, Tom, did anybody read it? I said, I read it a couple of times. He says, can I read it? I said, I was like, I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to let anybody read it because it just wasn't for anybody. It wasn't supposed to be for anybody. It was for my own sanity. I loved Lorenzo. So I said, I'll put it on the disc and I'll send it to you. A couple of months later, Lorenzo calls me and he says, Tom, we got to print this. You can't keep this to yourself. You got to print this. And I said, really? He says, yes. He says, I'll pay for it. Okay. But you're going to owe me it. You're going you're to owe me one. So like, well, you want me to pay it forward, you know? Right. Keep somebody do something. And I said, go read it. Read it. Tell me what you think. You know, and he read it, loved it. And then a couple of months later, again, it took about seven months, eight months. And he got in contact with me and it was, he says, Tommy, when's your birthday? I says, my birthday is March the 1st. He goes, I'm going to have, I'm going to have a present for you on your birthday. He sent me this on my birthday when I turned 60. I had nothing to do with the name. <laughs> okay. Yeah. What? My name is Harding. Of yeah. Course. Are you not? Harding. So he, he went, he says, Hey, I got something perfect for you. He says, hope you love it. And, uh, there you go. I got a book. And then everything started to change. My life started changing again. 
you know? Try to pull it up right now. So if I'm not... Um, you go to... A, I, I sent you the link for www.tommyharding.co. Oh, it's not hard. It's not com- hardening. No, no. Just, oh, okay, so I'm so Shopify. So Shopify. Just go www.tommyharding.co. Okay, it's not on Amazon. Yeah, it's on Amazon, but but Amazon uh, wanna 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 cost a lot, and I'd rather do it this way where I make more money. Right. Oh yeah, we'll we'll put the we can put the um. The limo. Well, I mean, I'm trying to pull it up on Amazon. You're giving me another. You're you're asking a lot of people had props looking it up on Amazon, but you can get it right. It is on Amazon. <laughs> but Shop- Shopify is uh, where I got it right now. I'll send you the link for uh, the what where it's at on Amazon, if you want. Okay. Um, I'll send you both. But like I said, I, I prefer to use Shopify. Yeah, yeah, it came up. I, I, it came up. It came up because uh, I, I just put in your whole name. Yeah. Instead of just the last name. So yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Look at that. Like I said, it's with that phone. Yeah. <laughs> go through Shopify. I sign them. See, you get it from Amazon. They're not signed. Right. My, my my spot on Shopify. I sign every book. Well, I mean, then give me that link if you want to give me that link. Yeah, I'll, I'll, get you. I'll send you. I'll send you that link instead because I signed all of those books, and things started changing. Um, when the book came out, um, um, I got these movie people wanted to talk to me. I got the freaking mayor, the mayor in uh, in the uh, in Save of North Carolina, got a copy of my book, and he contacted me, and he wanted me to help with the gang problems in Fayetteville. So I went to City Hall. It's going to be in the documentary. I went to City Hall and I spoke before the city council and trying to let them know the best way to save, how to save kids. Mostly of them are African-American children that are forgotten about uh, out there. Seriously, you know what I'm saying? So I spoke to, I went to a bunch of churches. I spoke at churches, you know, trying to help. So I'm paying it for it as my friend Lorenzo wanted me to. But I'm finding that it's, it's it's bigger than Lorenzo. It's bigger than me. You follow what I'm saying? Where? And now I'm starting to get to a point where I'm going to be, you know, trying to get my story mob out there. That's my main my main thing. The bounty hunter stuff. That's all good. Well, I find it opens the door for other things. It's great. More pay me. Sure. It just opens one network of people or whatever. But when I read that story about my mother's in this, right? My mother, my father, my brothers. I'm like, fuck yeah. This is this is it. This is the story. This is it. Jimmy's in it. Everything about Jimmy is in this fucking thing. All the stuff that I told you about what happened to me, all of this stuff is in my life. You know, about this African American kid that got involved with the at an early age with the with the, with gangsters, monsters, or organized crime, whatever the hell you want to fucking call it. You know what I'm saying? Right. That grew up, that grew up in Brooklyn. He grew up around white people. You know what I'm saying? There's nothing out there on Netflix like this. I, I took I took it as a test to myself. I said, let me check something out. Sylvester Stallone came out with Tulsa. Tulsa. Okay, yeah. Tulsa King. Get the fuck out of here. I saw that. I couldn't believe it. It was horrible. And the only reason why anyone's fucking watching it is because it's Sylvester Stallone. Well, Stallone's in it. He didn't kill anybody until the fourth episode. And it really wasn't all that great. It was it wasn't written really well. Then I saw the, uh, the the Hulk, King of Harlem with the Force Whitaker. Oh, was that oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a little yeah, yeah. older one. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, no, that's still new. It's not old. It's new. Uh, Google it. Force Whitaker. Uh, Harlem something. I can't remember the name. And I saw a pilot for that. That was a, better than Tulsa King, but it's actually, uh, uh, I don't know. I was never really a Force Whitaker fan. You know, I, it's hard for me to picture him as this gangster, you know, like Frank from American Gangster with Denzel Washington. Yeah. I couldn't make, like, lay it I couldn't, I wasn't buying it. You know what I'm saying? But it was more violent. And, uh, and, uh, my shit, you read my shit? Oh, I was like, oh, I was really blown. And now I'm a movie buff and I'm a drama series buff, you know? So, uh, I'm not trying to pat myself on the back, but I am trying to pat myself on the back with this fucking, uh, uh, mob that I want you to read. 
want you to check it out. Tell me what you think. Did you ever um, do a, an audio book? No, not yet. Bro, not yet. An not yet. An I haven't done that yet. I will no, allow to be 30% of my income on the books is from Audible. No shit. Yeah. And I didn't read it, by the way. I didn't do it. I didn't read it. Like I'm a horrible reader, bro. Horrible. So I actually uh, had somebody who did it and we just worked out a deal. Like he has 50% of it and he took care of everything. Took the book, read the book, did a great job. It's done amazing. Put everything up. I didn't have to do anything. But I mean, you might say, "Hey, I, I'm, I'm, I can read the book fine. I'll, I'll do the book myself." You know. Well, well, this is what I'm going to tell you because I got to be leaving shortly, okay. and 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 uh, uh, I want to tell you this, okay, to me and you. Um, I like you, okay. I find you interesting, and there's a lot more things I want to talk to you about, okay? Because uh, 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 there's another, there's another story out there it's about my brother. That's been in jail for 22 years. Something else I want to talk to you about, about that, about his case. You, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, we could do an episode on it. Yes, yes. I want to definitely talk to you about that. And I want to talk to you about a few other things too as well. Because uh, let me tell you something. Um, I enjoyed telling this story to you. And uh, you're real. You're for real. You're not, uh, you didn't get on my nerves that one fucking time. <laughs> A lot of people get on my fucking nerves. Let me tell you, 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 you wouldn't trust me. A lot of people, I either like you or I don't fucking like you. There's no in between with me. Well, yeah, we'll definitely, we'll have to do another episode. We'll have to figure it out. I, I'd, I'd love to talk about the, or, or read the the screenplay. Hey, I appreciate you guys watching the, uh, the interview. Uh, if you liked it, do me a favor, uh, hit the subscribe button, hit the bell so you get notified of videos like this. Also share the videos. It really helps with the algorithm. Uh, what also helps is leaving comment and uh, having interaction in the comment section. We're going to leave Harding, which is the book written by Tommy Harding. We're going to leave that uh, in the, or we're going to leave the link in the description box. So definitely buy a copy of the book. I really appreciate you guys hanging out with me and see you.